I've got premium quality brain food for you now from a brainiac of the highest order. Dr. Andrew Hill is one of the world's leading practitioners of neurofeedback. What that is and how he uses it to sharpen focus, cut anxiety, lift mood and brain fog, that pesky old brain fog, all that and the ecstatic practice of West African drumming, that is gonna blow your mind, and the mind-body power of Ashtanga yoga. He's gonna be telling us all about that, as well as some top biohacks to get your brain at its healthy best over the years. Hello, Dr. Andrew, how are you? I'm well, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We've had some false starts with this. We tried about we five times and we had a blizzard of technical issues. So everyone out there needs to just keep everything crossed for us, that everything proceeds smoothly. Away we go yeah. on this. So let's start with neurofeedback. What is it? Okay. Neurofeedback is basically a way of um, changing the brain through exercising either brain waves, which are called EEG or blood flow which are called HEG or hemoencephalog. So you can measure different aspects of the brain moment to moment and shape their activity. And this was uh, something discovered in how it's used today, maybe 55 uh, years ago in the late 60s and um, sort of by mistake. And uh, we use it today to go after sort of tuning the brain like you might tune the body up. So you can go after resources of sleep, stress, or attention pretty effectively. Um, it was discovered because it reduces seizures actually. So it's still used a fair amount to uh, work on epilepsy and other related seizure disorders. And it tends to work pretty well on the gross you know, regulatory features of brain fog, speed of processing, sleep, stress, attention. But how does it actually work? I mean, how do you get the feedback with you what know, tools? Yeah. So in the classic case of EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback on the EEG or the electricity, you might decide based on goals to um, exercise or shape or change the brain where you would bring down theta brainwaves and bring up beta brainwaves, let's say. So executive what function. And beta? What are, mm. What's the difference there? So we have little modes and modules that, that little bits of tissue can run in. And we have billions of little CPUs essentially that are combining and recombining all the time into little engines and some have dedicated roles and some have uh, roles that are very modular and can be turned on and off and recombined. And they all, each of them have brainwaves that they can operate in. And often they do a mix of brainwaves at once. Things that range from Delta, which is deep metabolic sleep and energy and the heart and lungs being run and cell metabolism, all the way up through things called Gamma at the high end, which is where potentially some aspects of consciousness might lie. But in between those, you can get a really clear sense of basic resources by looking through the scalp. So in uh, a lot of neurofeedback these days is practiced alongside a tool set called quantitative EEG or QEEG, which is an assessment. So if we did a QEEG, we might get a sense of how unusual your brain is. And that would give us some targets of things you might want to then manipulate or shape or intervene in some way. So but do you, do you, how do you do it though? Do you, how do you measure it? Do you stick, little you stick things to the scalp? Well, not magnets, but little, little metal wires. So uh, we have little silver or other metal wires in the case of doing uh, neurofeedback, you might stick a couple of ear clips on and say one wire on a spot on a spot on the right-hand side that's involved in knowing if you're paying attention and also involved with pumping the brakes on being impulsive and staging in and out of deep sleep and, and aspects of sleep. So that tissue, that little module is going to run, going to, going to help you pay attention and not go squirrel using beta waves. And it's going to release behavior and let things happen with more theta waves. In fact, if you look in children, the ratio of theta to beta at that spot predicts ADHD about 94% accuracy. You can blindly sort uh, ADHD and non-ADHD people into buckets. So um, wait, theta is what? P-H or is it? F theta, T-H, T-H, th theta. Theta, yeah. okay. So in order of going from slow to fast, delta is deep met metabolism. It's the heartbeat of the brain. It's deep dreamless sleep. And it keeps all the basic stuff in the brain and body kind of working. And then you go to theta, which is next. Delta is twice per second, roughly two cycles or two hertz per second. Theta is about four to seven, maybe. And theta is lubrication. It releases things to happen. 
And within that four to seven Hertz range, you have different specific frequencies that might do stuff. Uh, so it's not one thing like six and a half Hertz is a moment of releasing uh, insight for some people and bubble up memories that way. Um, wow. Seven, you have alpha, which is a rest mode. Alpha is a oversimplified category. We call many things alpha, but you can think of alpha like the car in the driveway running uh, fine, but not going anywhere yet. So that's alpha. It's an idling, a rest in between mode. It's a central frequency in some ways to the brain. It's also your speed of processing subjectively. Um, so you can have a needing Delta in order to get the car out of the driveway. You need to make Delta sufficiently at night to then have your alpha run at appropriate speed when you're awake. So you can then shift into your beta modes, which are the gas pedals across all the little motors and engines and things your brain might want to do control it. Yeah. So beta waves are more modular. You have little bits of tissue. We have things called the default mode network and the executive fun function network and the salience network, big, rich hubs, rich clubs of tissue that connect to other parts of the brain, take experience in from sensory tissues and then uh, 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 design behavior and execute on it. So but what are you seeing as someone who's reading the the, the amount of electricity, -E the amounts of, of weight. Uh, like I'm, if you stick a wire on the head and you measure of the amount of electricity, you're seeing a little squiggle. And that squiggle is a mix of theta waves, which have a four times per second little shape and alpha waves, which are 10 times per second and beta waves, which are like 12 to maybe 20 or 30 times per second. You see mixes of waves, squiggles. And you're predicting, you're, you're, you're measuring how many times the little bit of tissue, the micro column in the cortex is firing, is discharging little bursts of electricity and 30,000 neurons and about 25 to 50,000 glial cells create this computational unit that all fires at once. It all produces a rhythmic little burst in some frequency, a little electrical discharge. And the so ones when you pointing, go from brain to brain to brain, let's say you've got five people lined up and you're yeah. giving them this QE, QEGG, you said? QEEG, quantitative QEEG. EEG. Yeah. QEEG, and you're seeing the rhythms that are produced. Mm. Um, can you instantly see, oh, wow, this is happening for this person. That's Depends. For this other yeah, person. sometimes, some things, some, some gross things. Like if you open, if you closed your eyes, I would expect the back of your head to produce lots of alpha because that's the visual tissue, the occipital cortex. And there's nothing coming in, in when your eyes are closed. So most people produce this nice 10 hertz robust alpha at the back occipital tissue. If you don't, that's a little unusual. I might predict that and visually you can see alpha. That's why I picked this example. Or when you open the eyes, if the alpha stays nice and high, doesn't suppress and get replaced with beta, that's another phenomena. That's inattentiveness visually versus hypervigilance because you can't shut it off. So you can sort of see a flavor of anxiety perhaps, or a flavor of inattentiveness perhaps based on the amount of the alpha showing up as a healthy thing, not showing up, persisting when it shouldn't, et cetera. And QEEG takes your recording, so a cap on your head, squirt it full of gel, have you sit still for 10 minutes or so, eyes closed, 10 minutes or so, eyes open. Out of that, you then compare all the resting amounts of brainwaves, speeds of brainwaves, and connectivity patterns to a, a database of people that are age matched for you. And we see how weird Susan is. So, but <laughs> I, you know, it's weird. No yeah. Doubt. Well, well, people are, that's the thing. The job here is not to say, why aren't you average to say, oh, here's some unusual stuff. Let's decide, or let's um, explore some possibilities around how your brain might work. And so it is very uh, modeling driven, not diagnostically valid for almost anything, maybe with the exception of some executive function things. But um, how can you get a baseline for me? If, if I only go into your site, you, um, you have a, you call it the Peak Brain Institute, that's your HQ mm. in Los Angeles, and you've got mm -hmm. these, let's call them brain gyms all around the world, where mm -hmm. practitioners are, are performing these QEEGs. Um, I, I'm just wondering, what would, what would you use as a baseline for me? Because don't you need something qualitative to compare? Well, I would use an age matched sample, I would have, I would pick a reference data set that was comprised of people your age primarily, and then had some sort of mathematical average brain created out of a mix of people your age, people that are a little older, people a little bit younger, and 
basically measured what is average for how fast alpha alpha is a good a good example alpha waves are the idle speed like the car in the driveway and alpha is around 10 hertz for humans for adult humans around 10 cycles per second however it slows down a little bit it speeds up as you hit 2025 it, it hits its maximum speed as the neurons finish their insulation their myelination uh, and you finish uh, sort of doing all the building up of the brain and getting the most um, in, uh, a final bit of the frontal lobe built in your early 20s, the brain tops out at around 10 hertz for most people. And then it slows down a little bit as you lose cell tissue. And as you lose some myelination later in life, you, it starts to slow down. So like you if, can, you, if you're, does it slow down in very recognizable stages across the age groups? Then? It, in does, 40s, it, it does. It does. This and Absolutely. Maybe you, yeah, before there's, we there's, talk there's, about there's your brain institute, sure. let's, let's go through the different decades and what happens with each. Well, let, um, let me give you a very specific example within EEG because electro, EEG is a very broad area in a lot of ways. So there's one particular thing in EEG, which is really well understood in a lot of across the different domains of, of the brain. It's called the P300 wave. So about 300 milliseconds after you see something you're interested in or you notice, or you're attending to, or you observe, or you decide about, there's a positive little inflection. So it's not the ongoing brain waves, the, the endogenous sort of like background machinery doing the machinery stuff. It's evoked by the outside world or induced by something you've decided. So it's a little like event related potential, it's called ERP. And you can measure the ERP for one person. So you hear beep, you know, if I, if I said to you, Susan, I want you to listen for the unusual beeps, beep, 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 you know, et cetera. Yeah. Whenever you heard that unusual one, your P300 wave would change, get bigger and a little faster. Show because little, I was little, tuning earlier. into it or just Yeah, because. you were noticing it as the interesting thing. Okay. And the difference in the background one and the interesting one has a certain amount of height, you know, and how fast it comes online based on after you notice the information. That's your attention, your dopamine, your, your alerting, your grabbing information. And it's a very robust thing in humans. And as you get older and older, the P300 starts to drop in amplitude. Fewer cells come online when you notice stuff. And the peak of it goes from 300 milliseconds, starts to drift. So as you go up in decades, you know, you might start in your 20s when it's maximal speed, maximal amplitude, the most cell bodies, the most robust firing, the fastest tissue. You might have that thing in about 300 milliseconds and maybe it's got an, an amplitude of 25 or 30 microvolts. It's a really big little wave. Um, well, this is a big, a big wave. And then by the time you're in your 70s, it might have dropped by 30, 40, 50 milliseconds and be slower and the height of it, the amplitude of the wave might be blunted. You might only ha have like a you know, two thirds of that amplitude left. So this is just the ravages of age attacking. It's, it's losing cell tissue. Neurons. Well, there's two things. There's the speed of processing, the speed of the alpha, the speed of the index of the brain slows down broadly. As you lose cell bodies, you also have um, different aspects of uh, communication difference between the brain because of things like wear and tear and how you use your brain, et cetera. So some of it is just aging and speed of processing. This gets back to the idea of quantitative EEG. Speed of processing is a predictable thing. So is the P300 changing across decade. I could predict roughly how old somebody was based on how fast their P300 and how you know big it was. For instance, if I had enough people with you know that P300 wave, and there Have are you databases ever done that of test? such. You know, lined up ten people, not being able to see their faces or their bodies, blindfolded them, and then done the neurofeedback and been able to predict? I can know, look at, specific? I look at thousands of brains and I do cold reads. Yeah. All the time. Cause lots of my colleagues say, here's a brain. And I'm like, Oh, looks like this, this, and that's happening. And maybe this, and oh, ask about this. And that's my, it's usually right. Most of it's right. You know, when you do a cold read, but the people are weird. So it's not perfect. It's like, it, it, you don't want to diagnose off of this ton of stuff. You want to come up with ideas in if they ring true, then you found something. So in the case of alpha waves, if I looked at your alpha waves and said, oh, Susan, your alpha waves compared to the average person your age are running about a standard deviation slower on a bell curve. That's a little unusual. Just statistically, it's a true statement. A little slower alpha waves. That's your speed of processing, which oh, might be I, a normal just variant. Be so anxious making. Well, <laughs> just, may, well I'm conking hold, out hold, more than I hold thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. <laughs> hold, hold that judgment. Hold, don't mm -hmm. attach. Um, 
if I showed you that, I wouldn't know what it meant. It might be normal variant. Maybe you're built this way. Maybe you've been this way your whole life. Maybe you just got chill car. You got six cylinders, not 12. Who cares? Runs fine. Or but does that get back to my point? You know, baseline. Maybe well, we need to be. Well, I would I ask mean, you I, something. Yeah, I would predict something okay. from this. I would say, oh, your alpha wave is slower than average. This is often an indication that our speed of processing is slowing down too fast, faster than you want it to slow down. Are you experiencing word finding issues, tip of the tongue phenomena, hunting for words and names, forgetting things you were just told? And if you were like, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm hunting for words all day long. Ah, then this alpha speed I'm seeing is slower for you than you want it to be. It's slower than average, probably slower than it used to be for you. Aha, performance opportunity. Can I just put my hand up and say 80%? Yes, that's happening a lot. If Sometimes that's showing I just up. Think, yeah, but it's it's really, really befuddling though. Because, and you read about all the menopausal issues and you think, is this just because of my hormones jumping around and not doing, Maybe. not performing? My hypothalamus is not getting enough of something, or because honestly, it is the you're worst. You're probably not thing. getting enough delta waves at night, deep sleep at night, and therefore your brain runs tired during the day. Um, okay, well, listen. Do you know what? I want to park all this because, of course, I want you to run through what we can all do in order to maximize, optimize our brain health and to, you know, beat back some of this slow processing, etc. And I know you've got lots of well. Well, well that's what I'm saying. If you, if you. You shouldn't be dismayed if you find things that are real on a brain map, because if you find things that are real, and, and by the way, alongside the QEG, we always do an executive function test, which is very interpretable, very readable for distractibility and impulsivity and things like that. So the two tools give us a way to understand some things that might be true. The thing you, you kind of know it's true. And then if you find things that are real, you can change them almost always, almost always. If you understanding brains to... is hard, but changing yeah. brains is not that hard. No, I love this. But first, I do want to flesh out your background because you, you know, mm. we don't hear about neurofeedback all that much. And the brain has been your thing for a number of years. And and I want to, you know, tell people a little bit more about the Brain Institute before we get into all of the hacks and all of the exercises and what we can do over the decades. Because HQ in LA, you set that up some years ago, but yeah. I want you to chart your path for us from the lecture halls at UCLA, uh, where you did your PhD in cognitive neuroscience, to establishing your institute. And I wouldn't mind it at all if you would tell me the lovely story um, about your epiphany at 28, but before that, about what happened to your brother, the accident that led you oh. to start really thinking about, I need to be studying brains. So I, I did go to UCLA, you know, professionally, I, I started a little bit late, later in life in my you know, mid thirties in grad school, uh, there. And, um, that was after having spent 20, uh, 10 or 15, 20 years in mental health across different aspects. Um, I worked in patients in acute psychiatric facilities for several years. I worked in addiction centers. I worked in uh, aging units, uh, locked facilities. I worked in child units. Um, and all of that was after working in residential facilities with people with multiple disabilities who had very little communication, no language, often were deaf or blind, often were profoundly mentally disabled and had multiple uh, things going on. So I, I grew up in Massachusetts where um, there's a couple of states in the country, uh, in the US, that tend to have led the mental health and or health and wellness stuff historically, both good and bad. And Massachusetts was one of the first states to develop these state institutions called state schools, where they put all the folks that had mental disabilities. And then they were also the first state to then get rid of those state schools and move them to group homes and, and move people into you know, co-living co with you know, roommates for modeling healthy behavior and stuff like that. But I was working for an organization years ago that had some of the most profoundly impaired people as they moved out of those state school institutions. And so we spent years working with folks that had very little communication skill and the language um, were either deaf or blind or both and had developmental disabilities that were quite severe, two or three, four living in a, in a house. And I ran a home for a few years. I mean, I, we spent a year teaching somebody to use a fork. That was, the, that was a big accomplishment. Oh, wow. And after some time in that uh, uh, landscape, <clears throat> Jimmy, after some time in that landscape, I went back and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, grab me for one moment here. No worries. Grab, grab some water. 
lots of editing to do. I might need some too, because we talked we talked so much <clears throat> as, as yeah, we do yeah. uh, before we we started recording. Um, so, and you also you had your well, snowy Massachusetts. Your brother's accident when he was yeah. So seven. so uh, I ended up going into mental health and working in mental health to some extent because I was really curious about how the brain worked. My my brother had had uh, sustained a an accident when we were very young. I think he was in first grade or something, which is about, oh, I don't know, uh, six or seven years old or something in the US. Um, and he sledded into the street and was hit uh, by a car, was in a coma for several weeks and had some difficulties with obviously with the, with his function afterwards but a few things around how acutely his you know state change his consciousness change was uh, uh, demonstrated to me and also losing how a very losing a very small part of his brain created a lot of challenges in terms of specific challenges uh, in the year or two after he recovered from that. And then as he came out of a coma, how he had to sort of spend time with sensory stuff, with motor stuff, it was very obvious, very kind of like, this is interesting. It's almost like the brain is knocked back a decade or so, or several years into a childlike state in some ways. And he was having to then move back through that stuff. Now he was young enough that he was relatively plastic and those things did change and change back. And he you know, happy, happy end of that particular story. He graduated from college many years later. He's got a full-time job, wife and three kids, and, you know, has a great, very fulfilling life. So he managed to move beyond a brain injury as a kid. Um, but the, how sudden, how dramatic his experience was, was uh, very attention getting for me and started to raise questions around this, this mysterious thing that we carry around that we didn't understand. And, you know, this is in the seventies. Uh, we understand it very, or maybe the early eighties, very, very poorly back then. We still don't understand the brain that well now, but back then it was, you know, 40, whatever years ago, it was very, very, uh, uh, even more mysterious in terms of how it, how it works and what brain injuries do. And, you know, we still you had were working from a psychiatric approach as well, weren't you? And pharmacological approach, psych pharma, and all that when you're in these various institutions it was all about i mean correct me if i'm wrong but diagnosing the disorders and then well i yeah i was working as a psych tech in in inpatient psychiatric hospitals and it was it was very much you know working through diagnostic language with psychiatrists and uh psych nurses and then managing acute behavior and helping do work with uh, case management towards discharge and planning, but a whole, you know, people coming in with everything from extreme psychosis caused by drugs to schizophrenia to extreme self harm uh, across all age groups, you know. It, it, so I saw a lot of very acute things in people whose brains and whose, and whose capacity across different aspects of their brains were cramping up or falling over, were having difficulty, were being traumatized. And I got a very you know, unfortunately rich and deep and broad education in how human suffering and human dysregulation occurs. Yeah. That's really what, that's really what I attribute my understanding of the brain to. Honestly, I, I, I did a undergraduate degree, a bachelor's focused on neuroscience and finished it in like 1993 or something. And then went and spent all this time working in really acute psychiatric and brain focused work and learned so much just by working with people whose brains were not operating the way that they would want them to, honestly. But I understand from from reading some of the things you've written um, at Peak Brain LA, when you were 28, you had an epiphany of sorts because you had your own struggle with uh, hyperactivity disorder. Oh yeah, I was severely, definitely. severely ADHD, like the worst you've seen on the planet, uh, probably. Uh, I, I mean, I, I have worked with attention professionally for now many, many years. I have never seen a you know, severely ADHD kid that was worse than me basically growing up. And I kept that all throughout college. And, it, you know, it, part of why I went and worked in these acute environments is because I was very skilled at working with people. And because I was very skilled at working across different challenges. And that's sort of fed to the, you know, it's the same reason that people with severe ADHD go into sports or other high stimulus things, because under high stimulus, you're sort of using some of your strengths and you're not only hit by the weaknesses or the, uh, the challenges of ADHD, but I, well I ended up fine then though. ADHD. Sure. Oh, was sure. It? So, so the whole, yeah, 1984, the, yeah. in 84, the, um, I mean, 
there's the DSM and then there's also the colloquial understanding of it. DSM. It was pretty well, the, the diagnostic and statistical manual, the, the list of diagnoses that are used often um, to kind of categorize what thing is like ADHD, for instance. Um, but in 1984, there was a revision of that manual and psychiatrists got rid of the label ADD, which we still use, but um, colloquially, but there's no longer anything called ADD. It hasn't been for many, many years now, but yeah, at that time, I mean, I grew up in the seventies where it wasn't, you know, early, early childhood, so to speak, where it was not well understood and had somebody spotted me then they may, have, may have been some different interventions. I wish someone taught me to meditate or give me some neurofeedback in the seventies, uh, would have been a life changing thing well, back then. But I mean, how were you as a kid and as a 28 year old then, were you just all over the shop? You couldn't focus. You were easily sure. distracted. Sure. And moving. 9,000 times faster than almost everyone around me in, in almost every way, you know, as a chewing then. through books. And I mean, but the thing is I didn't have any difficulty as a student because nothing took any effort to, uh, you know, until at least maybe the end of college where I had to spend a little bit of effort, but nothing took any effort because I just had a broad, you know, so love you for everything. So I just dug into everything and chewed through it and moved on to the next thing and stuff that was difficult, the stuff that took structure and stuff that took, uh, you know, practice th those were difficult things but knowledge and just basic learning weren't weren't those things generally so so early on then in your career after you'd done the phd in neuroscientists in neuroscience and you did you were teaching as well at ucla in gerontology as well as um mm. cogneuro um then why did you why did you latch on to neurofeedback as the better way to help people well i started off working in neurofeedback before grad school um, I had been working in all these acute different environments with developmental issues. I had worked in acute environments with inpatient psychiatric, and then I got injured and ended up leaving working the, the, the acute inpatient environment because I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, so after a couple of years, I, I went to high tech for a couple of years and, and missed working with humans and went and found a job that sort of combined those aspects and did, worked in an autism center that did neurofeedback. I'd heard about it for a couple of years, was curious about it. And so I went back into uh, human services working in a neurofeedback center, and it was maybe 80% autism and 20% ADHD in this neurodevelopment center in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. Um, but what kind of injury did you have? Oh, I had a back injury working oh. in the psychiatric hospital doing uh, restraints. I, I, you know, it was a very understaffed, heavily, it was the most violent hospital in Massachusetts, has since closed, but mental health care. Uh, was getting rapidly under uh, rapidly defunded essentially, and the way insurance was supporting things, and hospitals were falling over left and right in the nineties. How intense! Um, really? So I was working in one of those environments and uh, just got injured, basically, uh, as as can happen, and left, and then came back a few years later into, into mental health, but into outpatient. And since I had such a rich experience working with children, working with developmental issues. The autism center nearby was sort of like, yeah, come, come work here. Cause you're really good with these hard, this hard, hard population. And I'm pretty good with kids, you know? So I had a great experience working there, but what I started seeing was all the ADHD and all the anxiety and all the seizures, all the sensory issues drop away in a few weeks and months. And I was like, wait a minute, this does not match my experience of what is possible with developmental populations. What's going on. This is, this is great. This is crazy. Um, I still struggle, though, to figure out how you get to that point, because you map the brain and then. Well, let's say we looked at your line. brain. Let's yeah. say we looked at your brain and saw that you had a lot of theta brain waves over regions involved with paying attention and you couldn't stay on task. Yeah. And you also reported not staying deeply asleep and being scattered and you wanted to work on that stuff. I'd say, OK, great. Sounds like you should bring up your beta and bring down some theta over the right hand side. That'll probably produce executive function changes. So again, we have a personal training metaphor here, not a diagnostic and not a medical. I have the answer one. It's, oh, here's some goals. Great. Oh, I think we see some goals in your data. Oh, and we, of course, test your executive function. So we'd probably see that you were also impulsive. You, you made errors on a task when you meant to pump the brakes, you instead clicked or something. So, so what would those, these tests be like? You know, well, I'd have you look at a number or... as it popped up on the screen. Right. And it'd be a, a one or a two. And uh, I might speak it over the speakers, a one or a two. And every, every about once per second for 20 minutes, one, two, two, one, one, two. And, and just click the mouse when the one comes up and don't click the mouse when the two comes up. Just that. 
just that for 20 minutes will tease apart the ways in which your executive function falls over, the ways in which you miss things, or the ways in which you click by mistake. Is it auditory? Is it visual? Short versus long-term? Are there trends? Do you correct them? Do you get people that are using it in an anticipatory way? Because I know when I'm getting my no, eyes tested, not I really that. because I'm anticipating because, it's no, coming. So then I use the click. Not really because the time, the landscape, the time scaling of this test is slow enough that your automatic resources have just gone offline. There's nothing to push back against. So within a few trials, you just kind of get into the rhythm, like trying to identify what it is. You identify, you prepare, identify, respond. Yes, people overreact, but there's 400 plus trials and we get the sort of sense of the different ways in which you're falling over again and again and again, not just once or twice. And we pick up inattention and pick up impulsivity as well as auditory processing stuff and visual processing stuff that teases out as a speed of processing and other stuff like that. So that would be then compared to a normative database and say, look, compared to other people your age, you're like two standard deviations below average for how squirrel you are. That might be in the way. Oh, look, your brain maps a lot of theta brain waves on this right-hand side. That usually comes along with impulsivity. We have a target. You want to work on this impulsivity? You do. Okay. So now we have a target. Bring down the theta. Bring up the beta and the right-hand motor cortex. So stick a wire in the head and put two ear clips on. And then watch something on the screen, like a little game or animation, puzzle pieces or a Pac-Man or a spaceship or a race car. And whenever your brain happens to make less theta and more beta for half a second, the computer goes, oh, good job, brain, and makes the game start moving or move better. So it's and like a brain... reward reinforcement. You'll it's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's operant feedback. conditioning. It's operant conditioning. Yeah. And that's the Definitely. exercise that you use to strengthen this deficit area. Yes. However, you can't control your brain waves. You can't feel them. So it's involuntary. The, the computer's applauding what you just did. The, the brain's like, oh, hey, wait a minute. Whenever I drop my theta, stuff's happening. That's weird. Cool. Okay. Because the brain has no idea this is not like a random new car you're learning to drive or a musical instrument or something else. It's like, wait, something's happening. It, it's reacting to me. The brain notices that. The mind does not. Just like when you're a little baby and you're flopping around and suddenly something random happens and you push yourself up in a push up and you're like, whoa, I can see a lot further. Cool. This Your is mind just notices seeing a lot further. You're, you, you don't think later on that day, oh, wait, got to activate my right shoulder, my left bicep and make them happen. You just do the thing and you learn to move. Right. So the brain, after three or four sessions of neurofeedback, of having your theta applauded whenever it dips, the beta applauded whenever it climbs, after three or four sessions, your brain's like, I'm going to reach for that. And it drops the theta and it rises the beta. And you're like, ooh, I feel calm and focused. This is interesting. But is, and it, if is you, it linked to your thought? You think no, it and intend to do that? No, no. Your theta is changing moment to moment. Your beta is changing moment to moment. Whenever it happens to go down, the computer applauds you, your theta, for instance. And then every few seconds, you move the goalposts. So it's shaping it, saying, yay, okay, now, not even less. May I make less theta. Great. Good job. Good job. Good job. Make less now. There you go. Good job. Good job. Good job. So and the brain's like, this is the cool. Applause, and then the brain likes react. input over when given a choice over a lack of input. Yeah. Any input, even annoying input is better than no input, according to the brain, generally. Well, let's go to that thing that happens to a lot of midlife women when estrogen and progesterone tanks and testosterone as well, menopause, mm -hmm. perimenopause. When that's happening for women in their early 40s, late 40s, 50s, and then they have actual menopause. What's going on with the brain there in the main? Um, because many women say, oh my goodness, out of the blue, and these are high achieving women, people who have had no issues, and even people who are just going about their daily lives, and suddenly their brains feel as if they've become toffee or molasses or sponge, yeah. and they're not able to reach for the words, you know, just basic everyday words. Yeah, it's speed of processing, it's the speed of the alpha. But how is it linked hormonally? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in terms of fixing it. Um, How's that? The, the reason that you're having word finding issues may be because you're north of 45 or 50 in a woman. It also might be because you had a concussion or you had COVID or you got exposed to Lyme or mold or chemotherapy. You've had trauma a lot and your deep sleep is tanked. There's a thousand reasons we experience this stuff. So Again, diagnostically, if you think you're having some difficulty with hormone regulation and the mechanism there is progesterone 
not being produced tanks the quality of sleep regulation, specifically deep sleep without deep sleep. You can't make, you know, you're having alpha waves slow down without alpha waves being present for a smooth idle. You can't shift between gears. You can't find words. You can't load them into your mind and move them into working memory. But if you have a progesterone issue, you want to adjust your progesterone, go see your endocrinologist, go talk to your doctor, you know, figure out if you want to approach that, figure out if there's an HRT strategy that makes sense for you based on history, family genes, history of cancer, the, the, the pluses versus the minuses, very nuanced, very important stuff. Are you familiar with Dr. Lisa Moscone's work? Um, she's finding how estrogen decline affects women's brains at menopause, irrespective of their age. When menopause happens, it's a temporary thing. Yeah, but it's really, she's overgeneralizing is my short take on it. Um, it's really linked to women who give birth and a whole cascade of, of particular hormone things that happen when you bear children and have men and then go menopausal to different kind of uh, uh, progression and aging than women who don't have children. Um, and also the thing that happens is not specific to women's brains and it's not specific to menopause. That's what I'm saying. I think yes, she's it's drawing the link though, eventually uh, more women get, get dementia. Yeah, it's um, not, that, that's not about men. estrogen. That's an autoimmune thing. Women have autoimmune function stuff that is dramatically enhanced. They have a, a raging immune system for a bunch of reasons. If you give birth, if you bear children, your immune system goes up even higher. You have autoimmune priming because you have bits of DNA around your tissue from on that aren't yours. Women have autoimmune stuff and, and most forms of classic dementia are not diseases the way infectious diseases, they are metabolic diseases. So Alzheimer's, most forms of like Parkinsonian stuff, uh, frontal temple dementias, they're not diseases of infection, they are metabolic. And if you have autoimmune stuff, dramatically accelerated. So I think all of her stuff is dramatically overgeneralized and has almost nothing to do. She, she found something that is a driver for a more common phenomenon is hanging a lot of ideas on it. Yes, women's brains are different and go through a climacteric change in midlife sudden drop of hormones, very destabilizing, feels really uncomfortable, just like yet for some women, like you had a concussion, especially with the sleep. A concussion that can off. last for two decades. Well, I mean, it can it's... if you don't address it. But again, the phenomena is what I care about, not the reason for it, unless there's something well, keeping it going. And well, that, I know and, the and metabolic not. theories as well, because I had Sam Apple, the author of Ravenous, on here, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of, you know, top tier scientists who are talk we're talking about metabolic syndrome and they're saying Well, that's my take as link. a gerontologist that most yeah. forms of, of dementia are metabolic. My 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 form my perspective as a gerontologist for aging women is they are more prone to dementia because of increased activity of the innate immune system. Amyloid is an immune molecule. It's not a poisonous molecule. It's an immune molecule. It's used to keep the body free of microbes to some extent. Uh, in fact, environments where you have high APOE4, Papua New Guinea, for instance, populations mostly APOE4, the traditional diet is mostly starchy tubers, high sugar, high, high starch, and there's very, very low rates of Alzheimer's and atherosclerosis there. Because the amyloid's being used to, to fight the, the dirty microbial environment. But you put somebody in a clean environment and fill them full of sugar and the amyloid just oxidizes into stuff that destroys the brain. Well, basically. and there you just mentioned it, the sugar, because they're saying that Alzheimer's is the third diabetes. It's, infl it's inflammation as well as, as a big yeah. driver. And women have more inflammation because they have an, a more active immune system, essentially, slightly. Right. I really do think it's that simple. And I think that you're seeing the estrogen progesterone drops precipitating, unveiling the phenomena, um, provoking more of a phenomena right then. But I don't think it's that dissimilar than what's happening in long COVID or in post-concussion syndrome in the NFL or in a mold exposure that's significant or Lyme co-infections that are significant and linger. I think it causes the same phenomena for brains, brain fog, slowed processing, alpha slowing down. But we can, uh, we can arrest it or slow the onset of the, the consequences of this by um, having had, having deficient hormones, estrogen, progesterone, we can augment those. We can use um, perhaps menopause yeah. hormone yeah. therapy. Not, it, it doesn't make sense for every woman, of course, because of genetics and because of some, some 
hormone, there, there are trade-offs in all HRT, of course, but it does seem to produce better health statuses for most women long-term. But the mechanism for speed of processing is often as simple as progesterone being supported to improve deep sleep, which then speeds up speed of processing. Deep sleep, lack of deep sleep is like having the handbrake on in your car all the time. So I've enough heard. deep sleep, you release the handbrake, things run smoother, the alpha runs smoother, you have this, you know. Well, let's back. go into that a little bit more for, for men and for women. I mean, I won't keep banging on about the estrogen angle um, because um, we could go all over the shop with that. I, I know well, I'm not a you... hormone expert, you know, That's, yeah, <laughs> so, no, but, no, but, but... but I also don't, don't think it matters that much. I don't care why your sleep issues there. If you're really mid, and I work with women all the time because it's it's been precipitated by menopause this sleep issue this brain fog this word finding issue so let's just work on the resources and tune them up getting better sleep habits what do you suggest that everyone do in order to optimize their brain function via sleep yeah so i i i think that really leaning into the circadian signaling the the information the brain has about what time of day it is, is pretty critical. And a lot of health stuff that is suboptimal for performance throughout life, as well as things that accelerate aging, things that sap uh, learning, memory, growth, and performance um, are around the circadian system, the, the brain's circadian or, or about a day rhythm and the earth's photo period, which is a day. Um, those things are synchronized in theory. Human brains tend to run about 25, 26, 27, 28 hours in natural circadian rhythm. And there's a one particular set of structures that will synchronize a bunch of clocks and then the cascading synchronization happens and it's imperfect. And there's several signals that will compete a little bit to tell you what time of day it is. And over many days, the brain will sum and extract the information start to get a sense of, okay, it's this time of day and adjust. And if we're not well-regulated, if the brain is trying to move into different modes uh, hormonally with circadian perspective, you know, ramping up and down different brain waves, et cetera, for different state changes, it causes very strange things and it, generally not great things in terms of health and wellness. Um, the intermittent fasting stuff with regards to the biohackers and anti-agers and things, there's a big push in the intermittent fasting world to, let's say a simple IF window would be 16, eight, where you're fasting for 16 hours and then eating within eight. It's pretty typical. And for, by the way, for premenopausal women, I do not recommend a window that's as narrow as eight hours, unless you're trying for some specific purpose. Women tend to suppress young women hormonal production really easily by overdoing caloric restriction or time restriction on, uh, or fat restriction. So there's really, this is getting a little far afield here, but the three ways I, when I think about biohacking, with regards to food, I think about partitioning three different things, time, calories, and macros. And you can play with them all to create signaling in the body. And that can be really useful for manipulating insulin resistance or causing a body uh, composition change or helping you with uh, a performance goal or something. But those are important for regulating brain health, aging performance broadly, especially with regards to figuring out when uh, well, you've well, got uh, some, some different ideas than, than what many of us are doing, because I focused a lot on the big middle, on menopause and mm -hmm. intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, and you know lowering carbohydrates in a therapeutic way in order to yeah. um, set you up for optimal. So, And I know that you don't believe in chronotypes and all of this. So if you mm. can pull all of that together for me, sure. what do you think? Let's say perimenopausal women what are we maybe doing now when we're skipping breakfast in order to elongate yeah. our resting, our fasting window? I understand that you don't think that's the right way to go. Um, I don't. I, I think that you should be having more of a fasting window at the end of the day than the beginning of the day. And broadly, the research shows this. You can find papers on ETRF, early TRF it's called, where there, there is improved outcome metabolically when you have a, a fasting window at the end of your day that's longer versus the beginning of your day. I mean, think about it. If you're able to fast, let's say starting at noon or something or 2 p.m., you get those hours before bed and then you get all of the time you were sleeping. It's, an, it's a longer chunk of time generally than if you flipped it. And if you just, you know, 
ate until 9 p.m. at night and then you ate again at like noon or something, you know, you get a bit more time, more it's really low difficult insulin though, time. Because our family and social structures are so tipped in they the other are, direction. They are. And there's a urge for carbohydrates as the insulin drops. You know, whenever insulin drops, we have an urge to eat. And a bunch of things will, will cause insulin to drop. One is having just eaten and store storing, you know, sugar causes insulin, insulin to drop. So after you snack, you want to snack some more. But another thing, you know, as you get, uh, if you're, if you're well-timed, a couple, a couple things to tie it together. One is the strongest exogenous cue from the outside world. Strongest cue for circadian rhythm is not light. It's not when you sleep. It's when you eat by far, by far, it's a strong signal. So you got to eat in the time zone you want to live in, or you're going to screw yourself up. So this regular TRF is practiced by biohackers and by many of the gurus. We'll have people eating quite late. And if you go to bed with any insulin that's high, any blood sugar that's high at all, you suppress growth hormone completely being released. Now, humans that are young humans have some growth hormone in a giant pulse a few hours after they fall asleep. Humans our age, we have almost, we have none. And then one little pulse that happens a couple hours after we fall asleep. Unless so what you have should the separation be then between the last meal? Are you saying four o'clock, that's it? And then I'm saying at least like ten? three hours, if you're dysregulated and if you're eating in bed, at least three hours of, of, of no calories and you may need more. It depends on your goals. And the I goals suppose for it depends what sort of insulin very, bounce you've had. Exactly. You know, exactly. whatever meal you've had. So if, if you're having- It depends a lot on the individual. Yeah. People's need for managing macronutrients, managing calories, and managing time is dramatically different one to the next based on goals. If you had a seizure disorder, I'd be giving you very different instructions than if you just wanted to like look good uh, at uh, you know next to me. Well, let's focus on brain fog. You know? Let's say that that's it, and word processing failure, or you know intermittent word processing issues. So brain fog. Let's let's focus on that. Yeah. What would you suggest? Because you I would track sleep. Me quality. Yeah. And I would have mm -hmm. you track ketones in your breath, not your blood, but your breath and have you, have you track your sleep and use those two metrics, the quality, amount of deep sleep you're getting and the abil abil ability to make and generate and use ketones in the breath relatively well, the metabolic flexibility aspects of that. And I would why focus is, on why those is two ketones in the breath better than measuring them. Uh, well, your blood reacts to what you ate within a few okay. minutes. Your breath takes two or three days of behavior to produce uh -huh. downstream shifts and enzymes to, ra to raise the general milieu of production and also of burning them. So you know it's a, it's a, a deeper shift if they're in your breath. Um, and also you don't measure them in your urine because they're only high with little strips and things until you're actually using them and they drop again, but you're still making tons of them. You're just not making so many that you're spilling them out in addition. So urine strips are useless for people during keto. And blood is not that useful. It's, you know, if you're diabetic or having trouble with blood sugar, it can be useful to measure the way you react to certain foods to figure out what's safe for you, what's a good goal for you. But I like breath ketones. I have a, I use this thing here. Oh, it's called the BioSense, big fan. Um, do you do that regularly? Yeah, when I wake up every morning and before meals, I do it. And I check my ketones, my acetone in the breath, which proxies for the blood ketones about 10 to one. So this morning I was at five. When I woke up, so that's that 0.5. No, that's 0.5. It's it, if if I was measuring my blood, it would come up as 0.5 at that point, which is light ketosis essentially. And if I'm eating low carb or doing some fasting or uh, eating very low carb, I will climb and climb and climb. And like for instance, if I did a 40 hour fast, uh, if I did no carb or very low carb yesterday and the day before. A uh, regular 36 or 40 hour fast would get me up in the 20s to 30s on this thing. Maybe maybe I'll hit 40, which is the top of this meter, you know, for the um, blood ketones equivalent. Because that's when the curves diverge a little bit. You can't really measure effectively in the breath beyond about four. But four is pretty darn deep uh, ketosis for most people. Okay. So if you can learn to hang out, if you learn to produce ketones in your breath, then you know you don't have high blood sugar, high insulin. You can't produce ketones. Because your body's using the alternate fuel. Well, because it's going to suppress the production. You can't, there's all, you're always doing both. You're always producing ketones from free fatty acids in the bloodstream, uh, which is about, um, you know, people talk about ketones versus glucose, right? The idea, well, are you burning glucose? You're already burning ketones. Total fuel use in the body. 15% of total fuel, fuel use roughly is split between glucose and ketones. 15%. All the rest 
15%. And, and, and most of it is if we're eating carbs is like, let's say of that, of that last little 15%, maybe 85 or 95% of that will be sugar burning. If you're having plenty of carbs coming in, you can fill your glycogen, burn it off, fill it, burn it off, et cetera. The last little bit will be ketones. The other 85% of energy is just based on free fatty acids, triglycerides and burning those and oxidizing those. So when people say you're burning sugar, burning ketones, well, yeah, as the last little bit, and then that little bit is always balanced between a combination of ketones and, and, and burning glucose, essentially burning sugars. And you can shift that pretty hard back and forth, but you can't ever get to the place where you're not burning any glucose because the brain always wants some. So if you're having no glucose coming in at all, the body makes some, it takes yes. That's the thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. That's the thing that I'm constantly explaining, but I'm not a scientist, so sometimes I get fogged by my ex my own explanation. And I just say, oh, I'll send you an article about this because you know, because somebody will say, Well, you're cutting so many carbs and your brain needs glucose. I say, Yeah, yes, but, but, but triglycerides, own. triglycerides, three fat molecules with a glycerol backbone. You can take glycerol and you can make it into sugar. Take two of those and add a water and you get sugar, basically. So yeah. Just make, you know, gluconeogenesis, liver makes enough sugar for the brain and will supply ketones and sugar basically to the brain as long as it needs it. But okay, you don't need very let's... much. You only need 20 grams of, of like carbohydrates in your whole system to keep you basically alive. That's it. Like so you're in a circulation of regular fasts, but start the wind, open the window early in the day, close it mid afternoon. Impossible for many people or kids and the way we structure it. Well, eight hours is fine, you yeah. know, but, but six might be better. Depends on the independent, depends on goals. If you're just trying to stay healthy, then 18, 16 is fine. Um, I would say two, three hours of not fasting before bed is fine. You can still have a family dinner and don't eat when you first wake up either. You know, when you first wake up, the thing that wakes you up is essentially cortisol. It squeezes your liver and feeds you breakfast. So you're like, woo, you know, you know, wide awake, theoretically, full of energy, full of, you know, stress, mm. theoretically enough to then go hunt in the forest for chickens and come back to your cave, right? Evolutionarily. Yeah. So in this case, you want to get, you want to be woken up by your cortisol because your brain knows what time of day it was because you didn't eat too late at night. And you want to then move, spend 10 or 15 or 20 minutes first thing in the morning, moving enough to burn off the cortisol and the glucose that woke you up, the glycogen, not call for more. You call right. for so more cortisol have to start and call for thinking, more. Yeah. I don't need a big jolt of fructose in the form of orange juice. You should or not. Oh, definitely don't, don't need anything. that. No, no. You should. And in fact, I would say before you eat anything, you should be doing uh, movement and exercise is actually another strong circadian cue. So warming up the whole body by doing a few sun salutations or something else, or doing some walking, something you can talk over basically will burn off the cortisol and burn off the glycogen that woke you up without calling for more. And if you're, if you've had a bunch in your system recently and you, and you flood the system with sugar or cortisol stress, you're now resistant to cortisol, resistant to glycogen or, or sugar. So it's an easy way to like minimize your fat burning, cause a stress response. So low key workouts in the morning, move your high key workouts to the afternoon when your cardiac output is at its best and your cortisol is at its lowest. Right. Okay. So and there's so all the circadian. That, that, that those are all three tied together. Fast before bed, get up early, and and do low key intensity fasted. And cycling back then, how does this help? Just draw the linkage to banishment of brain fog or improvement. Well, if you can, if you can symptoms. cycle better, then you'd be sleeping better. Getting into deep sleep when you are sleeping, first yeah. of all, you'll also you know be able to uh, get more sleep from the hours you get. So your sleep may actually get compressed and deepened depending. Um, if you don't eat before bed, you aren't suppressing growth hormone. Growth hormone when released will drag you into deep sleep. And all these things will speed you up and banish fog. Fog is, will look like your delta waves being high in amounts or really fast or really slow and your alpha being kind of slow and your beta being kind of low amounts often. And these are affected by rest. So you can, you know, you can look at a sleep tracker like the aura ring or something. And by the way, REM is nonsense on most uh, sleep trackers you would use. Just look at deep sleep. That's the only thing you care about because that's the only aspect of sleep that flexes in response to behavior. So I see you're wearing an aura ring just mm. there. And yeah. are you, I mean, do you think though that all this tracking and this data measurement to optimize our brain health and our sleep health and all of this, are we becoming obsessive? Are we taking it to ridiculous levels now? And that's you think our grandparents said the same thing, talking about blood lipids and cholesterol and things? No, I don't think that. No? I think we've become obsessed with measuring everything. Well, you don't want to become orthorexic everything. with it, but 
Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, before you could measure your blood sugar, did it matter if you were a diabetic, you know, yeah, it still mattered, but now you can measure it and control if you're having insulin or if you're having you know, too much sugar. I guess sugar my in your theory diet. was just throwing that out to you that we're getting a bit ridiculous. At you can get orthorexic with anything. Yeah. You can, you can yeah. be a gym bro and you can be, you know, anxiety driven and have dysmorphia around these, these things. Absolutely. And obsessive. Sure. But there's plenty of things to get obsessive about. I'm not concerned about watching health numbers as, I mean, you're less likely to judge them as, as damning numbers. If you understand them, if you like back to blood lipids, if you know your blood lipid panel and don't just rely on your doctor to tell you about it, then you know that let's say you're doing fasting and doing super low carb and you had a relatively high protein diet. Um, you would have very low triglycerides. You'd have very low VDL or VLDL, which is the dangerous version. You'd have moderate HDL and you'd have high LDL probably. The average human would have high LDL in that circumstance. And your doctor would say, oh, high LDL, uh, sorry, high, yeah, high LDL. It's kind of dangerous. It's a risk factor. And you would say, yes. But, but you want a statin tomorrow. But you would say, yes, but I have no free sugars floating around. Nothing's oxidizing. Look at my VDL. Look at my tries. Those are like the best numbers you've seen, right? Oh, yeah, they kind of are. Let's do a CAC and make sure there's no actual plaques. And if so, ignore the LDL. LDL here is a a firefighter, not an arsonist, essentially. So, you know, who cares? Um, So it's that kind of perspective on this stuff. Get deeper. Don't just rely on doctors to give you the answers. Become your own scientist and dig into the data. So I think if you do that, you're less likely to be caught in the obsessive, hyper-focused medical student's disease. Oh my God, I saw a number and now I have that problem. You know, I just uh, think if you're waking up out of a beautiful sleep and then you're suddenly getting obsessed with, oh, I don't think I slept properly. I didn't get enough deep sleep. No, no, no. Well, you, and you, you're wouldn't, feeling be, you fantastic. wouldn't be like that. You yeah. wouldn't feel fantastic if your deep sleep numbers were crappy on your tracker. Yeah. Okay. Well, getting back now to um, your specialty, which is everything to do with the brain. I want to know about the stigma that we seem to attach to broken brains. I mean, well, anyone, anyone with a brain impairment ends up feeling the misplaced yeah, personal guilt around people that, you know, you did something, you, yeah. the human did something to generate this. Well, well, not just that, but you should be in control of it. The thing you have, the obsession, the anxiety, the ADHD, the seizure, whatever. Why don't you control this? Why isn't it, you know, cause you can't see the broken arms. So you can see the, you know, the, the cramped up anterior cingulate producing a tick or Tourette's or something, you know, it, it's a real brain thing though. And you can see it on a brain map on a QEEG. So that's a lot of the value that I place in using brain mapping and teaching people about themselves is like, oh, let's look at your brain. Hey, look, your brain's different in this way and this way and this way. Wow, that makes total sense. Oh my gosh, wow. And when you see suffering, so to speak, in that way, it's not damning. Like I was saying at the beginning, don't be, don't be worried. You know, when people see stuff, especially like they see their tinnitus or they see their OCD or they see their PTSD, suddenly we pulled the teeth of the stigma. And they can be frustrated without being ashamed. They can be frustrated without being angry at themselves. They can you know, be not happy with how they're feeling without being guilty. So, because look at your brain, look here, your the red, big red blob of beta on the back middle of your head, your brain's caught in rumination. That's a very classic PTSD thing. Or wow, look at this, 25 years of drinking. You can't shut off the beta waves anywhere. Oh, wow. My brain's damaged. Okay. That must be so comforting to p- people who have had long stay. Well, not just that. I can then show them then pers- 10 people like them who we changed their brain a few months later. Well, let's know, get into concerned. how you change the brain then a little bit yeah. more, because I know we, we started to get into it and then I pulled you back to add some context about your profession and your um, academic credentials. So tell me what's happening to the brain. 30s, processing power slows down. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Take us through the different age groups. Well, it slows down. D- just that. But but there are that. hacks that you can do. Um, we talked about sleep. There's several hacks you can do broadly. One is keeping your inflammation down, so to speak. You know, so you keep your protein up moderately. High, especially as you get older, 50s, 60s, 70s, you need more protein. Um, you don't need huge amounts earlier in life. It may be counterintuitive, it's counterintuitive, but in your thirties, forties, and fifties, too much protein can shorten life. It looks like, um, but, uh, enough protein, uh, as an elder, as something 30, 40, fifties and above, uh, keep oxidized. You basically, the humans can get away with eating extremely high protein and very, very low carb or extremely low protein 
and extremely high quality carb. You can kind of do either. You can do like the, the hardcore whole food vegan diet and it's successful if you're very, very careful. In the absence of saturated fats, you can actually be healthy or you can do a carnivore diet. You can't really do both in the middle. There's nothing in life, nothing in nature that's like fat, carbohydrates and protein all together in food. It doesn't exist. Yeah, that I mean, gives I guess- it- some of the scientists I've been talking to, they're talking, you know, leveraging protein. Um, yeah, leveraging protein using, is really important. And that yeah. for aging seems to be the safest and the best way, especially for brain health. So 0.82 grams per uh, pound or essentially a gram per kilogram will roughly do it or just below that will do it. Um, that's a lot of protein. It's a lot of protein for the average person. Most people don't eat anything close to that. Nothing close and to that. Your brain behaves very well on this, doesn't it? Well, it produces more ketones in your, your liver does. And then you end up with a higher ketone bath. The brain enjoys eating ketones yeah. uh, and using it for structural materials. So um, the brain does slow down throughout life because you lose myelination and you lose cell bodies. So you lose you know, uh, signals slow down because of the wiring, uh, the fat, the myelin that wraps wires starts to degrade. Um, when, when that's pathological, we call it multiple sclerosis, but it happens to us all to some extent. And, and that produces slower wiring zaps, a slower transmission, and you lose cell bodies, you lose the number of cells that are firing the message, which slows down as well. So every decade, you lose a little tiny bit of speed and a little bit of tiny amount of power in the brain. But I can look at you and tell you if your brain is losing more than the average person your age, if it's expected amount yeah, or if it's too much compared to the average person. And even if it's the expected amount, who cares? If you if you would rather it not slow down, it's like bone uh, density or muscle mass. Yeah, sarcopenia tends to rob us of muscle mass and bone so density. But if you'd like to have training. more, yeah. exactly right. Viplate, strength training, high, there are all kinds of things based on goals, based on need, based on if there's impairments and suffering, there's all kinds of ways to intervene. What about that's what I want more... to do is take the brain stuff out of the landscape of here's what's going wrong and into a, here's what's happening. And then here's a bunch of ways to steer it, affect it, impact it, including. Well, it's more like feedback. exercise for the brain, what you're doing. You yeah, know, it's, you're... it's like a, it's like a, 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 a somewhere between exercise and, and physical therapy almost or OT because or occupational therapy, because once you train the brain for resources of attention, stress, sleep, speed of processing, it takes over and practices that every day and becomes permanent. Have you noticed now that we're living longer and, you know, you can you can get pedantic around some of the numbers and some of the trends and what COVID did to give life expectancy um, a haircut, but we're living healthier, longer. You've been doing this for a number of decades. Are you noticing that it becomes more difficult? I mean, it's the data set that you're comparing things to um, changing or reflecting the fact that we're aging differently. Um. No, not really with regards to aging, but yes, with regards to children, because aging, we're aging about the same, honestly, uh, healthy aging anyways, is the same as, it, as now as it was 50 years ago. Um, there's different pathological aging, but I use an av a heavily cleaned average data set, a healthy data set to compare people to. So no, that, that's the same for aging, but children, you know, the, the theta beta ratio, there's several papers published in like the late eighties, early nineties that showed the theta beta ratio can sort ADHD from non ADHD buckets, thousands of kids and adults, 94% accuracy, accuracy in kids, really clean and inattentive spaciness, 81% accuracy in high alpha relative to beta, super amazing signal. Like that's diagnostically valid. And then several grad students and scientists every couple of years tried to replicate it. Every time a paper was published, the statistic went down slightly over about a decade. And we realized in, in one conference one year that, hey, wait a minute, this is the same kind of thing that happens with sleep deprivation. So the population of kids in our clinics was getting more and more sleep deprived across a decade. And that was producing an insensitivity of one of the things we had looked at. It used to just be an ADHD marker, but now it's ADHD and classic sleep issues. Can't tell them apart anymore. So no, the you know, heavily cleaned average data sets that we use for comparisons, the, the yardsticks are the same. Is but this a byproduct are... of increased screen time and social media? No, absolutely and... not. Absolutely not screen Why not? time. I mean, screen time has no impact logically... negatively. Why? Well, you would think that the brain, a kid's brains, children's brains are changing because, you know, they're having to do homework via Zoom at eight o'clock How... at night. Well, that's, that's about... Of... 
I don't know when I was, not, well, I mean, I wasn't asleep at eight o'clock at night when I was awake in the seventies. So you don't think social TV, media is was, creating issues and the digitization of, of pretty much no, everything? No, full stop. Interesting. Does not change the brain. Are there well, other it, neuroscientists? Habits, who... habits can affect things, but no, the, uh, uh, uh all stimulus is managed and manageable. And this is just a lot of stimulus. There is more stimulus coming in, in modern to modern people than young people than, than, than when we were young 20, you know, 50 years ago, whatever, but, but no, uh, stimulus is stimulus. And this is not a different qualitatively in any, any other form. Screens are not magical. There's nothing different about them than anything else. It's not a more ever present stimuli. All, it can all be. the screens everywhere at school can be. Can be, but kids having to be on as opposed to just you know, ah. going up to the tree fort and hanging out with their pals. 100 years ago, people were really concerned about radio and television, too. All right. It's all the same. Well, there, there's it's all always the same. a big hue and cry, though, but you know, lots of parents are, are increasingly worried because I don't know anything. I don't know any of the stats like you do, but it feels as if more people are saying, my kid's hyperactive. They've got an attention deficit. Past and three years, parents understand what's actually happening with their kids because they see them. And kids are anxious. And there's, there's definitely a childhood, an epidemic of childhood anxiety and childhood sleep issues. That's causing trouble. So really, but, it's sleep. But there's no more ADHD schedule. than there was, you know, 50 years ago. So parents need to get, I, I suppose, get their kids to bed earlier and get them on a, yeah. a better schedule, a better pattern yeah. of sleep. And there's, and there's bad training. If you, if you always give your kid a screen, if you're giving them a stimulus, it's the same as giving a kid a reward under any circumstance. Like you gotta manage stimuli, you gotta raise your kids still, but screens yeah. are not more magical than anything else that's, that's stimulating. But I guess when I was a kid, you know, we played kick the can in the streets until dusk and we were out all day on our bicycles in nature, you know, rocking around the quarry at the edge of town yeah. and nature was stimulating our retinas. You know, we mm -hmm. were getting all of that excellent natural juice into our heads. I think we're probably still getting a lot of it, even in cities, even in concrete jungles, you know, I think we're still getting enough from humans are ridiculously adaptable, yeah. ridiculously adaptable. We can live on nothing but carbs. We can live on nothing but protein. We can live on in the dark all the time. We can, you know, we can live on microgravity and survive. Like we're ridiculously adaptable. We can live in environments that are, would not support human life, sub-zero environments and survive. We can extract, you know, we're ridiculously adaptable. That's, that gets back to your question about chronotypes. Yeah. Yes, I was just going to mention that because you read a lot of different people are adaptable. To people. people can and change. You so go chronotypes, to bed at 30 yeah. and you get up at four. And I've, and I've done the opposite as well. Doesn't matter. You, you learn to adapt. You, you learn what the cues are and you learn to drive the system around. And once you know where the levers are, you can change things. And the most important thing to set your circadian rhythm is morning when you light. eat. It's when you eat. But isn't morning light also a weak. Big part of the equation? It's weak. It's the weak. It's the only light that matters. And it's a, it's the weakest of the circadian cues in terms of environment. When you eat is stronger, being active when you're active is stronger. When you sleep is stronger than light and light is like fourth or fifth and morning light sets only in the first hour of, of sunrise too. Once it's an hour past sunrise, the color of light has changed. No longer provides a strong reset on the super chiasmatic nucleus and the vasopressin. So you have to get up early for this oh, to work. Wow. Cause I was getting up at seven 30 and thinking I'll bounce yeah. out to the garden to get that panoramic view and the long, as long as you get so some, you know, as long as you get some light out of the corner of your eye in the first hour of sunrise, you're getting a circadian cue from the light, the temperature of light, the color of the air, you know. And then 16 hours later, doesn't the melatonin start to dictate that you might start to be thinking about sleeping? Yeah, ideally. Um, and you're, it's suppressing insulin release in the pancreas. That's what melatonin does too. That's, so that's why you shouldn't eat it, by the way, because you aren't going to metabolize food you eat as you get tired. You're going to crave you know, insulin dropping a little bit because all the melatonin release is suppressing insulin release by the pancreas is something you feel the drop. And that makes you want to crave. I store up your food and go, go to sleep and, you know, 
store food because we not didn't grab didn't, the bag of crisps that you should never be eating late at night. Yeah, because you like, you can't store it. So all you end up with, with high blood sugar and then you go to bed and your body's trying to release some insulin, like high blood sugar suppresses court, suppresses uh, growth hormone. You have high cortisol. You wake up you so go you to bed well full. Not sleep if you have some heavy. Yes, snack it's better to bed. stay up for two, three hours and burn them off a little bit than it is to go to bed with a full stomach. Dramatically better. Absolutely. Now you'll screw your circadian rhythm up either way. So the next night, eat two hours earlier or something and teach your body about, about that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you a question that um, I pitched around to different friends and family members, and they wanted me to ask you about their athletic children, um, about brain injuries and how they present, you know, right uh -huh. after a kid gets slammed in the head on the rugby pitch, how, how things might develop years later, because especially where you live in the United States, we hear a lot about concussion and football yeah, injuries. Less and less. Yeah. You, you can't fill kid teams anymore in many, many States because parents are pulling their kids out. I mean, is that time. just a, a, a new worry or is that completely legit to optimize your child's brain health? It's dramatically time? legit. Yeah. You shouldn't let your kid, you shouldn't let your kid as a child to do contact sports. Nothing. Nope. Soccer's okay. No. Really? No, especially not for women, young girls. Young girls have, uh, are just as strong as young boys. They receive more injuries from soccer, like double the rate than boys do. Um, yeah, soccer is not great for the brain. Neither is American football. Uh, you know, fence. Pickleball? I know that's big. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think of any contact in pickleball, right? I don't know. I, I would say, no, say non-contact sports is ideal until your brain's finished growing in your, you know, in college, or you're an adult and can decide the risk factor. You don't want to, you know, take that risk on for a 12 year old and say, look, I'm going to have you do football or soccer right now, because I think it's awesome. And I don't really care if you're 20% duller 10 years from now in college, you'll figure it out. Well, That's the perspective you you're having, throwing your kid into a, into a soccer game. Yeah. I wrote on your, I read something you wrote on the blog. You said that these injuries may look like a goose egg that goes away, but they bloom over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Half of all brain injuries are silent and have no symptoms and then show up over five to 10 years later as slowed processing, degrading speed of, speed of, uh, uh, quality of sleep, speed of processing, word finding, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, the um, and, and even even to, simple yeah. concussions or even COVID, post-COVID brain doesn't show up right away. But three months later, you have this foggy state. So a lot of the insults the brain experiences produce very subtle initial effects and then they grow over a few months. So if you have a kid who's doing a contact sport, definitely keep an eye on them, not just after the concussion they may have gotten, but like six months later. Um, there's some, there's some good people who can do evaluations and figure out what's going on, both, you know, in a sport context and a general context, but these are not I things suppose you should note ignore. If they get a terrible head slam, you know, note it down because in four or five years, you might be able to trace it back. Not just oh. that, but if you have a, if a kid got a concussion, that's it. End of season. Do not put a kid back in for play because the second concussion is the one that causes massive damage. Once the tissue is oh, wow. all stiff and friable and fragile, then you go back and get a second concussion a week later. That's the one that destroys your brain. Do most so I would know say this, that though, and sports coaches at the schools, of course, they know this at this point, if they don't know this because they don't want to, um, seriously, I mean, you know, people, people know, um, I, if I had a kid who really wanted to play football, really wanted to play soccer, really wanted to wrestle, I'd be like, all right, but you know, here's our rule. A, we're going to do a bunch of assessments and a bunch of stuff to minimize inflammation and maximize recovery. And B, if you get hit, if you get a hard hit, we're going to be we're going to be like, that's it for the season. And we're going to give you a two month recovery window because we cannot risk not knowing what's happening to your brain with inflammation, have another hit happen a month from now and have a brain injury. We can't risk that dude. And how so, would you mitigate inflammation for, let's say a 13 year old? For similar ways, you know, depends on what they're doing and how they're creating inflammation, but diet, no you know, hot and cold. Yeah. Dep no, it depends. A 13 year old might need carbs to maximize athletic performance. Probably do honestly. Dr. Hill, I know we've overrun uh, by at least 20 minutes, but I do want to ask you about uh, something I teased in the intro, West African drumming. Tell us about why you, for a number of years, were going up to mountaintops and what sort of brain benefit you got from that. Well, well broadly, I think that, um, especially non-Western music that involves polyrhythm and involves bimanual coordination, really helps bring, I mean, most forms of music bring the brain online globally. It's not a, not a one hemisphere function. 
Um, and when you're producing music and or listening to polyrhythms, you get the much more bimanual, bilateral involvement. So for me, this particular flavor of music, uh, I, I learned a, a style from West Africa called Malinke or Mande drumming, which is countries like Mali and Burkina Faso and Ivory Coast and Senegal, um, many uh, uh, other tribe or tribes coming from those countries, the Mali Empire, you know, the, the Lion King, essentially. The, uh, um, there's about 16 different core rhythms and they involve many different instruments. And the one, so to speak, doesn't resolve the way Westerners are used to hearing it. And it produces really interesting rhythmic time. So there's that inflection. There's also the idea that if you look at things like Takatina, which is a system developed by Reinhard Flatchler, who was developing, I think the maybe apocryphal story, he was developing some psychosis as a teenager, I think in Austria or the UK or somewhere and ran away and studied at the foot of a tabla master in India, learning these really complicated, super long rhythmic phrases. And as he learned more and more rhythm, his brain became better and better integrated. Oh, fascinating. So I learned, I, I found it very integrating. And I used to, uh, all of our centers in the, in the before times, we had a lot of in-person groups. We used to do a lot of classes around uh, drumming because it got people you know, in the embodied time thing, which is really useful for change. I don't want you to crash into your next engagement. And I know we're already doing that. But I also mentioned that you are a big practitioner of Ashtanga yoga. Why is that? Um, I think Ashtanga, I think yoga in general serves a lot of the biohacks all at once. If you're doing a 20 minute you know, 10 sun salutations first thing in the morning, then you have moved the whole body, burned off cortisol, burned off blood sugar, not move so much. It's time, it's timing, you're doing it early. It's just enough. It's a perfect little balance. It's a function stacking thing that brings all of the different aspects of a little bit of meditation, a little bit of exercise, some time regulation, et cetera, et cetera, some fasted, you know, burning off cortisol all into play in the same yeah, I remember you said me. when you're doing those poses and no one's leading you in them, you learn them and then you do them. Traditional you... style. Yeah. yeah. Mysore style. Uh, the, the city now known as Mysura used to be called Mysore. And so Mysore style Ashtanga is a often an open room with a teacher walking around and people being taught the style of yoga, but they're working their way through wherever they are in it. And the teachers usually giving them individual like guidance around their particular practice as they move through it. So people are often in different places throughout a much longer practice. So I'm a big fan of my, of, of my source style or strong if you're learning it, but once you know it, once you know a sun salutation, it's like nine poses and they become overlearned. So you have a direction you're looking a way you're breathing and a way you're moving and it takes a minute to a minute and a half to do. So you can use it as a meditation, use it as an exercise if you do 10 of them, you just exercise for 20 minutes. It's a sort of like a perfect little chunk. Yeah, sure. it can be. It can be. And it's also a better moving meditation is easy if you're bored when you meditate. It's easier thank, than. Thank you, you know. so much for all of this. It's of been course. fascinating. Dr. Andrew Hill, functional neurofeedback practitioner, founder of Peak Brain Institute, helping us to preserve and improve the health of our all important brains. A full roster of links, of course, will be on the show page as ever and always. I thank you so much for listening and for watching. If you're catching this on my spiffy new YouTube channel, can't thank you enough for pestering me to move the audio archive over there. And now all of the videos will be joining that. What is it? A hundred plus episodes. Go well, Dr. Andrew. Thank you so much for all of your important knowledge that you've shared. It really was fascinating. See you all in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, Susan. Thank you.